The night before the main attack on December 13th, General Burnside gathered his senior level commanders to go over the strategy for December 13th's attack. Unlike most Civil War battles, there was a unique command structure in the Union Army here at Fredericksburg, and it involved a layer of command between the Corps level and the Army commander. They were called Grand Divisions, and there were three of them. The right Grand Division with uh, several Corps, each Grand Division had several Corps. The right Grand Division under Edwin, Edwin Sumner had the responsibility for the area around the city of Fredericksburg itself. The center Grand Division was under Joe Hooker and was really not all that involved in the fighting. And the left Grand Division, whose job it was to attack the woods that you see behind me under William B. Franklin. Burnside outlined an attack that involved simultaneous dawn attacks on the 13th by Sumner and Franklin's Grand Divisions. Franklin had about 60,000 men for his attack on the area that you see behind me, which was held on the right flank of the Confederate Army by Stonewall Jackson's Second Corps. That attack would be the main attack. While well, simultaneously to that, Sumner would attack up Marie's Heights and hit Longstreet's Corps to keep them in place while the main attack took place here at what we now know as the Slaughter Pen Farm. Burnside's plan was that if they could break the Confederates on the right to the north and the west, they could get 60,000 men between Lee's army and Richmond. And they would also be able to outflank the strong position behind the stone wall that Longstreet's men held on Marie's Heights. So they outlined the plan and the way things were left was that Burnside was going to send written copies of the orders that they had discussed to each of the commanders. So Franklin came south. It's a considerable distance from the main body of the Union Army. And he came south and started to prepare his attack for dawn, which would have been around 5 a.m. in the morning, 5 a.m. that morning. Well, by 7.30, he had heard nothing of the written orders. They had already lost several hours of daylight. Finally, the written orders arrived. A general that was on Burnside's staff had been slowed by ice and by the wet roads. And when he did arrive, the copy of the orders that, Fra that Franklin received bore little resemblance to the orders that he had understood uh, from the night before. The orders that Burnside gave him basically said that he was to attack with at least one division, whereas Franklin understood that he was supposed to attack with as many men as possible, that he was the main attack. He thought from these orders that he was no longer the main attack and other plans had been made, but the problem was they had already lost several hours in delay, and so he didn't take the time to clarify the orders with Burnside, and out of his 60,000 men only attacked with about 8,000 in total far fewer than he needed to dislodge the 10,000 or so Confederates that were defending the tree line that you see behind me.
We're now actually on the extreme left of the Union line near where Abner Doubleday's division would have been deployed. And behind me you see a single gun. And though it's really noisy here, not only because of the wind, but also because of the main roads that I'm on, this is where the gallant Pelham earned his name. Let's talk a little bit about that. On the right side of the Union attack was the division of Brigadier General John Gibbon. Gibbon was born in Pennsylvania, but he grew up in North Carolina. And he went to West Point, and when the war broke out, he sided with the Union. But three of his brothers did not. They joined the Confederate Army, and what Gibbon didn't know is he led his division, assaulting the Confederate position, which included the brigade of General Lane, who had North Carolina troops. What he didn't know, John Gibbon, was that the division he was attacking was the division that included his three brothers.
We're now standing right at the edge of the trees. That railroad was the objective that Burnside had given to the left side attack because that railroad was the key to being able to supply the army on its march to Richmond. If the railroad could be secured and the roads could be secured, the army could march south and be well supplied. Just one of the little tricky parts of the topography here, as we're on, I think, the right side of Lane's brigade looking toward the Union lines, you can't see more than about 50 feet in front of me because of the way that the hill slopes up. When General Meade's division broke through the Confederate line, it provided the best opportunity for the Union to win the battle here on the left at the Slaughter Pen Farm. And he sent two separate couriers back to General David Burney of the Third Corps, who was in reserve back near where these houses are. Because General Burney was with the Third Corps, he felt he was under no obligation to obey a request from a First Corps division commander. And so he refused, twice. Finally, Meade, who was known for his temper, rode back himself and angrily told General Burney to bring his men forward and support the attack. But by that point, it was too late. The difference in the battle here at the Slaughter Pen Farm really came down to one of reinforcements. The Confederates got their reinforcements up quickly. The Union did not. Both General Gibbon here on this side and General Meade to the left, when they broke through the Confederate line and cut them in two, were desperate for reinforcements. They were desperate for support to come up. General Burney's 3rd Corps Division was back here, and Lee, who was an inspector general for uh, General Gibbon's division, came back here and found two regiments scrounging for ammunition in a ditch, and he berated them to get to the front and support the attack, or else they were going to be shot. But a lieutenant colonel from one of those regiments actually very sternly told Captain Lee that these men were veterans and they knew what they were doing. And that was the end of that conversation. By the time the fight here at the Slaughter Pen Farm was over, 9,000 men had fallen, 5,000 Union soldiers, 4,000 Confederates. It was a fairly even fight and this was the best chance the Union had to win the Battle of Fredericksburg. They very nearly did. Meade and Gibbon broke through the Confederate lines. They were unsupported by the nearly 50,000 men that were held in reserve and never committed to the attack. This was probably, in my opinion, the greatest blunder of the Battle of Fredericksburg was the inability to support the breakthroughs by Meade. And Meade was incredibly frustrated by that. It was one of his biggest regrets and it was something that really aided him for a long, long time.